April 14, 1912. The dark night was filled with horrible sounds of a giant metal vessel breaking into two. The largest ship of that time collided with an iceberg that was on its way. The Titanic, one of the biggest stories of the 20th century that people still talk about. The starboard side of the giant vessel brushed up against the iceberg. It was 11.40 p.m. when things started going wrong. This iceberg caused enough damage for at least five watertight compartments in the hull to start filling with water. The crew immediately began a brief investigation to see if they could do anything and fix things. They had no one to rely on, all alone in the darkness of the cold night, far away from the land. The North Atlantic Ocean, around 400 miles south of Newfoundland, Canada. They needed time to figure out how to bring people to safety. They had some time, true, but not enough. If you watched the movie, you know the ship didn't plunge immediately after the icy doom had happened. The whole process lasted a good 2 hours and 40 minutes. But the situation was hard. There were 2,200 people to take care of, including crew and passengers. And things happening on the ship were chaotic. The chief designer, Thomas Andrews, soon realized they wouldn't be able to stay afloat. By midnight, the entire crew had begun preparing the lifeboats for launch. They had 20 boats with space for only 1,178 people, which was just a bit more than 50% of the people on board. The order was to get women and children to safety first. Crewmen were there to row and guide the boats. The scene over the next two hours gradually started escalating. The crew members had a task to wake up passengers and warn them something bad was happening. They wanted to place them into a fleet of lifeboats as soon as possible. At 12.15 a.m., some crew members sent out a distress signal. A steamship called Frankfurt was among the first ones that received the message and responded, but they were about 170 nautical miles away. Some other ships also got the message and offered their assistance, but sadly, they were too far away as well. At 12.20 a.m., the canard liner Carpathia got a distress signal from the Titanic and changed its course right away. They were 58 miles away at the time, and it would take them more than three hours to get there. 20 minutes later, the crew was lowering the first lifeboat. It was carrying only 27 passengers, although it had room for 65. Many of the lifeboats that were launched first were well below capacity. Crew members were worried, thinking the Davids wouldn't be able to hold a fully loaded lifeboat. And in the beginning, many passengers were just too afraid to leave the ship. They still thought Titanic was unsinkable and couldn't imagine the scenario that was going to happen one to two hours later. The crew was firing the first of eight distress rockets. Unsuccessful, no one was close enough to help. By 1.20 a.m., they lowered 10 lifeboats. Number 8 had only 28 people in it. One of the passengers on the number 10 was 9-week-old Melvina Dean. She would later become the last survivor who lived until 2009 and turned 97. It was 2 a.m. already. Three of the collapsible boats were the only lifeboats that remained on the ship. The bow of the vessel had sunk low and had tipped far under the surface. People around it could now clearly see stern propellers above the water. Crew members were lowering collapsible lifeboat D from the roof of the officers' quarters with over 20 passengers in it. As the ship's bow went under, the water was washing collapsible A from the deck. Those 20 people were struggling because their boat was partly filled with water. As crew members were trying to release collapsible B, it fell. Before they righted it, the water swept it off the ship. 30 passengers still managed to find safety on the overturned lifeboat. At 2.17 a.m., the ship's wireless operator decided to transmit one last distress call. A minute later, the light on the ship finally went out. Titanic and all left on board plunged into darkness. 
The bow continued to sink, and the stern was rising higher above the surface, which placed great strain on the midsection. Horrible sounds were filling the night. Titanic, this massive, legendary ship so many people placed their hopes in and were excited about, broke into two between the third and fourth funnels. Reports would speculate it took about six minutes for the bow section to reach the ocean bottom. The stern settled back in the water before it rose again into a vertical position. It remained in this situation until it finally disappeared into the ocean. At 2.20 a.m., the stern apparently retained air inside and water pressure crushed it as it went down. The stern landed about 2,000 feet away from the bow. People consider the Titanic the fastest ship in the world. They thought it was unsinkable because four of its compartments could be flooded and that still wouldn't cause a critical loss of buoyancy. Its life was problematic since its beginning. While the ship was leaving port, it moved within a couple of feet of the steamer New York. It managed to safely pass by, which was a huge relief for all those worried passengers massed on the ship's decks. Titanic sailed off on the 10th of April. Its first journey was across the highly competitive Atlantic route. On the launch day, the Titanic became the biggest movable object in the history of humankind. 882 feet long, 92 feet wide. Not that big if you compare it with today's ships. The biggest cruise ship in the world today is Royal Caribbean's Symphony of the Seas, which is roughly five times the size of Titanic. If you put that ship in a vertical position, it would be nearly as tall as the Empire State Building, which is 1,250 feet without antennas. But Titanic was a huge attraction back in its time. At one moment of their journey, they stopped in France, after which they made another stop in Ireland. Once the final passengers boarded, the massive ship set out at full speed for their final destination, New York City. Four days after the beginning of its journey, Titanic failed to divert its course from a huge iceberg, the story we all know about. Only 700 people survived, and most of them were women and children. The night was extremely cold one hour and 20 minutes after Titanic had gone down to the bottom of the ocean. Survivors weren't even sure someone was coming to save them. Finally, they saw the light. It was Carpathia coming towards them. They came for the people in the lifeboats. The crew brought them aboard and pulled a handful of other passengers out of the water. Many ships tried to contact Titanic a few hours after it sank. Their messages were never returned. Later, when there was an investigation of what really happened, they discovered the Leyland Liner California had been less than 20 miles away when Titanic was sinking. But the crew didn't hear the distress signals coming from Titanic because their radio operator was off-duty. Countries from both sides of the Atlantic were shocked and horrified when they heard details of what happened to Titanic. They decided to make changes to ship operations, rules that would help avoid such events in the future. They held the first international convention for safety of life at sea, where they adopted rules for every ship to have lifeboat space for each passenger on board. Also, lifeboat drills became mandatory. They also decided to establish an international ice patrol, its main role was to monitor icebergs in the North Atlantic shipping lanes. Ships also needed to maintain a 24-hour radio watch. Titanic wasn't built alone. Because of the size of this magnificent ship and all the new equipment it required, it would have been too expensive as a one-off. So the team built the Titanic alongside two sister ships, and both of them had eventful lifetimes. RMS Olympic came first. It was launched in 1910, and for a whole year was the biggest liner in the world. The Britannic was another sister ship that sailed for a while before it too ended down on the ocean bottom.
But only Titanic became a legend and one of the most fascinating stories of modern history. Meet Arthur John Priest. No, he isn't famous for being a painter or for discovering some long-lost treasure. He didn't invent some cool gadget or break any world records. No, Arthur John Priest is famous simply for being unsinkable. Proving one can be both lucky and unlucky at the same time, Priest was involved in and survived several mishaps at sea, including the fateful maiden voyage of the Titanic. Priest was not a rich man interested in sailing for pleasure. He was part of the working class, employed as a stoker or fireman, stuck for hours within the hot bowels of large steam-powered vessels. His job was dirty and difficult. He was responsible for keeping the furnaces lit, feeding them coal to ensure enough steam was produced for the engines to work. He had to be careful about not overheating the system or setting fire to the whole ship. The furnaces had to be carefully watched and constantly fed. He breathed it all in a while working and fighting with the sweat and the dirt. He would often work shirtless because of the heat and was always covered in black coal dust. And when he finally had a break, his shared living quarters were nearby in the same part of the ship. He must have been good at his job though, because he had no trouble finding work. But wherever he went, bad luck seemed to follow. The first incident was a mild one. As a young man, Priest worked on the RMS Asturias, the passenger liner first set sail in 1907, traveling between Southampton in the UK to Buenos Aires in Argentina. At some point during its maiden voyage, the ship suffered a small collision. The damage was bad enough that the ship returned for repairs. Thankfully, there were no reports of any serious injuries. Priest, unfazed, simply went to work on another ship. But his bad luck lingered on the Asturias. In 1914, the Asturias became a hospital ship helping care for sick men and women around Europe while bringing them home to England. But in March 1917, at just around midnight, the ship was struck by a foreign object. Its hull was breached and the engine room flooded. The captain ordered everyone to abandon the ship, sending crew, patients, and health staff scrambling for the lifeboats. The vessel was still moving, powering through the water because the main controls, located within the flooded engine room, could not be turned off. The captain refused to leave the ship while people were still trying to escape. He was able to aim the Asturias towards Bolt Head, where it finally hit land and couldn't sink. The remaining lifeboats were lowered and the final survivors made it to safety. When they studied the damage on the ship later, the Asturias was declared a total write-off. It might be hard to pin this particular disaster on Priest. After all, he wasn't even on the ship at the time. But it seemed that many of the ships on which he served were destined for trouble. His bad luck followed him to his next job on the RMS Olympic, a massive ocean liner. The Olympic was big. In fact, it had been designed and built as part of the fleet that included the Titanic. But with size came sacrifice. The Olympic was great at moving in one direction, but very difficult to handle when it needed to turn. It was September 1911. The Olympic was trying to alter its course. The Hawk, a smaller ship sailing nearby, didn't give the larger vessel enough room to maneuver, and the two slammed into each other. Because the Hawk was engineered to deal with potential confrontations when out at sea, its reinforced bow tore through the Olympic. Two large gashes appeared on the ocean liner's side. The propeller shaft was badly twisted, and worse, the ship began to take on water. Somehow, the Olympic made it to shore without sinking, and nobody was seriously hurt. Priest had no idea that this was just a small taste of what his future held for him. He next found employment on a brand new ship, a better ship, an unsinkable marvel that was said to be the biggest vessel to have ever been built. Yes, he was going to work on the Titanic. And what a job. It took 29 boilers, requiring 850 tons of coal a day to produce enough steam to power the Titanic. Priest was just one of 150 stokers toiling away in the ship's underbelly, keeping those fires burning day and night. He made around $30 a month. But on April 14, 1912, he would find himself flung from a world of extreme heat to one of blistering cold. At approximately 11.35 p.m., the crew spotted an iceberg. The Titanic tried to avoid it, but the alarm had been sounded too late. 
Five minutes later, the two collided. The iceberg tore through the hull, and the once watertight compartments inside were badly ruptured. As the cold Atlantic water flooded in, the ship began to sink. Distress signals were sent, but the closest ship, the Carpathia, was over three hours away. In the dark of night and stuck in the middle of nowhere, the crew and passengers panicked. Those who could scrambled for the lifeboats. Others jumped into the icy waters. In total, only 706 survived that terrible night. Priest, at the time of the collision, was down in the ship's lower quarters. He was on break, relaxing from a hard day of work. And as the ship went down, so did his chances of survival. He and his fellow workers were in the most dangerous position on the ship. They had to make their way through a maze of corridors and gangways, some of which were flooded in a mad dash to the deck. And then they faced the frigid water, jumping in and desperately swimming to safety. The ocean was so cold that Priest even suffered frostbite before finding his way onto a lifeboat. He was one of only 44 stokers to survive that night. After an experience like that, most of us would never set foot on a boat again. But Priest had to work. His next job also ended in disaster. He was offered employment on the HMS Alcantara. It went down in 1916, and Priest was again one of the few to make it to safety. He was badly wounded in the process. But he kept pressing his luck, and his next job as a stoker may have felt eerily familiar. He would be working on a ship built by the same people behind both the Olympic and the Titanic. And this ship, named the Britannic, was the biggest of the three. It was also believed to be a superior vessel, fitted with new safety features after the Titanic sank. For example, it had 48 open lifeboats, 46 of which were the largest ever used on a ship before. Two of these were even motorized and equipped with special communication devices. The good news? The Britannic survived its first trip without incident. It was already doing better than the Titanic ever did. However, on November 21, 1916, the Britannic was shaken by a loud explosion while traveling through the key channel in the Aegean Sea. The hull was damaged, and some of the compartments began to fill with water. But, unlike the Titanic, the Britannic had been designed for just such an emergency. It had been fitted with five watertight bulkheads. Intact, these would help keep the ship safe and floating for a much longer period of time. But there was one issue. Portholes along the lower decks had foolishly been left open. As the ship tilted, the portholes let in water, which flooded the Britannic and hastened its descent into the sea. This effectively made those watertight bulkheads useless. The ship was going down fast, much faster, in fact, than the Titanic had sunk. 35 of the lifeboats were successfully launched, saving most on board. Of the 1,066 passengers and crew, 1,036 survived. Priest, his luck intact, was one of them. And yet, he still wasn't done with a life at sea. He accepted a position as a stoker on the Donegal. It was a smaller passenger ferry that had been converted for use as a hospital boat. In April 1917, it was struck by a foreign object while fleeing an unsafe situation. And though he suffered from a head injury, Priest was again one of the survivors. It took experiencing two collisions and four sinkings before Priest was finally ready to retire. In fact, he reportedly said he only gave it up because no one wanted to sail with him. Can you blame them? He would live out the rest of his life on dry land in Southampton, England, with his wife, Annie, and their three sons. But Arthur John Priest would always be remembered as the unsinkable stoker. April 1912 marked one of the most terrible tragedies in the history of the world. The most unsinkable vessel, the pinnacle of engineering at that time, the huge Titanic, sank. On that dark, moonless night, the ship had many chances to save its passengers, there was another ship just a few miles away that could have saved the Titanic, but it didn't. It wasn't a phantom ship, and it's not some legend or a theory. This is a documented reality. There are records and witnesses' statements confirming this, but why didn't this ship help? Let's find out what happened that night by looking at these events from three different points of view. Let's start with the Titanic version. 11.30 p.m. The moon hides behind black clouds, Visibility is bad. Everything is calm on the Titanic. 
Under the captain's guidance, the communications operator stays in touch with the mainland through the radio. At this moment, some stranger breaks into the frequency, interrupting the operator's communication. It's unclear what this strange man wants and what he's talking about. The operator doesn't try to figure it out. He shouts at the guy, demanding him to disconnect. The connection is interrupted. At 11.40 p.m., the Titanic crashes into an iceberg. The ice breaks the hull. Water begins to flood the lower decks. Nobody is panicking yet. 20 minutes later, at midnight, the ship's crew sends a distress signal through the radio frequency. Few people understand how bad the situation really is. After 20 minutes, at 12.20 a.m., they start lowering lifeboats with passengers. At 12.25 a.m., they receive a response to the distress signal. This is RMS Carpathia. Their captain reports they're already sailing at maximum speed towards the Titanic. But the problem is that the crash site is 58 miles away. This means Carpathia will only be here in four hours. At 12.45 a.m., the sinking ship's crew release rockets into the air. These flares are one of the main reasons for the terrible fate of many passengers, but more on that later. 90 minutes later, the Titanic's deck breaks and the ship dives underwater. At 4.10 a.m., the Carpathia finally arrives at the shipwreck location. The crew members make heroic efforts to save all the people. They take 705 survivors on board. At this moment, another ship appears. It's SS Californian. The Carpathia sails towards the New York coast with all the people. The Californian floats in search of passengers and finds nothing but wreckage. The ship was only a few miles away while the Titanic sank into the icy water. The Californian could have saved these people, but did nothing. Its captain, Stanley Lord, made one of the most terrible acts that a sailor can allow. He didn't help a sinking ship. When the world found out about all this, they detested Captain Lord. They couldn't bring charges against him, and the trial didn't punish him. But his career was ruined entirely, as no other ship company would hire him. Despite this, he never confessed he had been guilty. Before he passed away, the captain said it hadn't been his fault. If this was true, then what happened there? This brings us to the Californian version. It's the night of April 14th. The Californian is sailing in the cold waters of the North Atlantic. The ship gets into a section with a lot of icebergs. At 10.10 p.m., Captain Lord stops the ship. It's too dangerous to move around this area, as they can damage the hull. At 11 p.m., the ship starts drifting. It's impossible to move in such conditions with such poor visibility. The captain knows that the Titanic is coming here, so he orders the radio operator to warn the ship about the danger. Radio operator Evans turns on the receiver and tries to contact the Titanic. He spends about 30 minutes on it. The connection is finally established. At this moment, the Titanic radio operator is speaking with the mainland. Evans interrupts this conversation and tries to warn the ship about icebergs. The operator doesn't understand Evans' words. He's annoyed because Evans broke into the channel so brazenly. He shouts at Evans and cuts the connection. Tired, Evans turns off the receiver and informs his superiors about the incident. It's still a mystery how the captain reacted to this news. He probably thought the Titanic knew about the danger. He lets Evans go to bed. If Evans hadn't turned off the radio and waited one hour, he would have heard a distress signal from the Titanic. But you shouldn't blame him. At this point, he has no official reason to stay at the transmitter. Evans is too exhausted and can't fight drowsiness. So, Evans goes to bed. The Titanic begins to sink. Its captain sends a distress signal. The operator on board the Carpathia catches it, but the Californian doesn't, since the receiver is turned off. Captain Lord can't sleep. He feels that something is wrong. Meanwhile, the Titanic is rapidly sinking under the water. The captain gives the order to launch rockets into the air. And here is where one of the critical mistakes takes place. They release warning lights, but they are not red. The crew forgot to take red rockets on board for some reason, so they lit up the sky with a bright white light. If you need to send a distress signal, 
you need to release red lights. Captain Lord sees these lights, but doesn't perceive them as a cry for help. It can't be that there are no standard red rockets on such a massive ship as the Titanic, but unfortunately, it can. Captain Lord thinks the Titanic is sailing away. Perhaps there is some unknown reason behind those white lights, but he doesn't really know. So, Captain Lord has no idea that the Titanic is sinking. He still decides to contact the ship, but this time, not through radio communication. Captain Lord doesn't wake up the radio operator and sends a signal to the Titanic through a signal lamp. It's important to understand that many old school captains didn't take radio communication seriously. They didn't understand the value of this technology. That's why Captain Lord doesn't wake up Evans. He sends light signals, but the Titanic doesn't respond. Many survivors later mentioned seeing the flashing lights of the Californian, but there was nothing they could have done. The ship's crew doesn't hear their cries for help. At 2.20 a.m., the Titanic completely goes underwater. A little more than two hours later, radio operator Evans wakes up and turns the transmitter on. He hears many rescuers talking about the sunken ship. Evans understands everything. He reports this to the captain. At that moment, the Californian immediately heads to the wreck site. They meet Carpathia there. With the survivors on board, it sails towards New York. The Californian stays sailing and looking for people. They find nothing but wreckage. The Californian returns to the mainland. The news about the ship that could have saved the Titanic is spreading all over the country. The trial begins. Captain Stanley Lord and the crew tell their version. They say their ship had been standing still. Many people don't believe them, and some of the surviving passengers claim to have seen the Californian sailing by. Still, the judge declares them innocent. 1962. Captain Stanley Lord is a very old man. He calls a notary to confess something. The captain makes his last remark about this case. He swears he's not guilty. But if it wasn't the Californian sailing past the Titanic at that moment, then what? The Samson theory could answer that question for us. The sealing ship Samson is sailing in the cold waters of the North Atlantic. The crew aren't sleeping. They carefully study the surroundings, but not because they're afraid of icebergs. They're scared of meeting with the U.S. Coast Guard. The Samson ship's crew catch seals, which is illegal. At 12.45 a.m., Samson's captain sees white signal rockets. The team is sure it's the Coast Guard. They turn off the lights and sail away. It's dark, so they don't notice the sinking Titanic. They return to the coast of Iceland and hear about the disaster. They realize they have abandoned the drowning passengers. The nephew of one of Samson's crew members reads about this story in his uncle's diary. The nephew asks for permission to publish these recordings. All the people realize that Captain Lord wasn't guilty. But unfortunately, he didn't live to see this moment. Actually, it's still unknown who is guilty in this story. Two ships were nearby the Titanic. Their captains were adequate people. They would have helped save all the passengers. Their fault was that they couldn't understand what the Titanic wanted on that dark night. Someone forgot to put red flares in the box. This small but fatal detail was one of the leading causes of the tragedy. A beam of electric light pierces the darkness over the calm waters of the Atlantic Ocean. The Titanic is quietly making its way through the waves, its passengers asleep, when suddenly a monstrous white shape is caught in the light beam. The fateful iceberg is about to rend the side of the legendary ship. April 14, 1912, only two days before someone will take a photo of a giant iceberg with a pretty unusual elliptical shape. It turns out that this iceberg most likely formed out of snow that fell 100,000 years ago. Researchers use computer modeling to figure out its origin. They use data from 1912 and added some new information about winds and ocean currents. They concluded that the iceberg was probably a part of a small cluster of glaciers in southwest Greenland. 
These days, it's possible to calculate the roots of such icebergs in any given year in the past. So the infamous chunk of ice was on its way from Greenland to an area further south from Cornwall. If the ship had passed through that region only two days later, the iceberg would have moved far away from the point where they met. At first, the weight of the most well-known iceberg in the world was 75 million tons. With time, it started to slowly melt away. And when it sank the Titanic, its weight was only 1.5 million tons. By the time of the collision, it had probably been melting for months. But it was still a true monster. When the Titanic sank, the iceberg was 400 feet long, and more than 100 feet of its surface was above the water. Some people believe it was a supermoon that caused the Titanic to sink. That night, there was a rare lunar event. It hadn't happened for 1,400 years. In normal conditions, the iceberg wouldn't have traveled so far south without melting and losing the largest part of its mass. But the supermoon could have been the reason for an unusually high tide that pulled the iceberg away from the glacier way faster than usual. There's a specific type of bacteria that slowly consumes the remains of the Titanic. Salt corrosion, ocean currents, freezing temperatures, plus this rust-eating microorganism might consume the entire wreckage. American actress Dorothy Gibson was aboard the Titanic. She survived, and when she arrived in New York, she started filming a movie called Saved from the Titanic almost right away. The movie was released only a month after the Titanic sank, and in the movie, she even wore the same shoes and clothes she had during the actual disaster. The movie was a big success at that time, but the only known copy was destroyed in a fire. 14 years before the Titanic sank, a novella called Futility had been published, and it seemed to have predicted the whole event. The plot centered around a fictional ship called the Titan that sank during its voyage. The Titan was almost the same size as Titanic, and they both went to the bottom in April. The reason was hitting an iceberg, too. Both the real and fictional ships were described as unsinkable, and both of them had the legally required number of lifeboats, which, as it turned out later, were nowhere near enough. We've seen it in the movie, but there were some real-life love stories happening on the Titanic, too. Thirteen couples even took a trip on the Titanic as part of their honeymoon. One of the couples owned Macy's department store in New York. Once it became clear the Titanic was rapidly sinking, the woman refused to go into a lifeboat without her husband. But he didn't want to join her while there were still women and children who he thought had to go first. Then his wife gave her coat to her maid. She insisted that the maid should get into the lifeboat, and she wanted her to be warm. As for the woman herself, she decided to stay with her husband till the end. Some people believe Titanic sank because of a mummy, not an iceberg. It all started around 1000 BCE with a mysterious woman who lived in Egypt, in the city of Thebes. People knew little about her, but they called her a priestess. Her mummy was put in a wooden sarcophagus and covered with a large lid with the image of her face and some mystical inscriptions. This place had been hidden until the first half of the 19th century when a group of locals accidentally came across it. They disturbed her peace. No one knows how, but the mummy disappeared that day without a trace. A couple of decades later, a group of rich friends from England traveled to Egypt and found the empty mummy casket with the image of the priestess, whose dark eyes seemed to be looking into the void. They decided to buy it, but the buyer disappeared the same night before he even got the case. All members of the group had some accidents. The casket changed its location a couple of times until it, as some believe, ended up on the Titanic. It took more than 70 years for a robot submarine to find the ruins of this legendary ship. The wreck lies nearly 13,000 feet under the surface of the Atlantic Ocean, split into two halves. Why did the liner break apart? No one knows exactly. Some think it happened because of the water that got inside when the ship collided with the iceberg. 
The pressure was so powerful, it separated two parts of the vessel, starting with the ship's bottom structure. Others say it was because of the hull rivets. They had a high concentration of slag or smelting residue. And that's something that can cause the metal to split apart. The ship generally had many flaws, starting with the design. The watertight bulkheads weren't completely sealed on top. This allowed the water to flow between the compartments and, in the end, sink the vessel. The iron of the ship's rivets and steel of the hull ended up ruined because of high sulfur content, cold temperatures, and high speeds. The steel shattered and the rivets popped out quite easily. Because of this, Titanic sank 24 times faster than it would have otherwise. If the ship had hit the iceberg head-on instead of ramming it with its side, it would have probably stayed afloat. How come the crew members didn't have binoculars? It would have surely helped them spot the iceberg on time and maybe even avoid the disaster. But the binoculars on the Titanic were locked in a storage cabinet. Only one crew member had the key, and he had been transferred off the ship right before it set sail. He later said he hadn't remembered to hand over the key. But even without the binoculars, the ship might have had some time to change course and avoid the collision if the crew had gotten some warning. But that's the thing. Someone did warn them. About an hour before the incident, a ship that was relatively close to Titanic, the SS Californian, sent a message to inform them it had stopped because of dense ice field. But the warning never got to the Titanic's captain. Some experts say it was because the radio operator didn't think it was that urgent. And later, the SS Californian said they didn't get a call for help from the Titanic because their radio operator was off-duty. Some say the crew on the Titanic couldn't spot the iceberg on time because of an optical illusion. Atmospheric conditions that night probably caused super refraction, which could have camouflaged the berg. After all, no one actually saw the iceberg until it was too close to the ship to somehow avoid the crash. Not even a whole minute passed between the moment they saw the iceberg and the collision. It was only 37 seconds, and it took Titanic 2 hours and 40 minutes to disappear below the ocean's waves. On April 10, 1912, the RMS Titanic set sail from England. But this wasn't the launch of a regular ship. The Titanic was the largest liner ever built at the time. It was 882 feet long. That's nearly the size of three soccer fields. And measured from the hull to the top of the smokestacks, the ship was an impressive 175 feet tall. That's the size of a 17-story building. Deemed unsinkable, it took 3,000 workers almost three years to build. But a mere four days into its very first voyage, at 11.40 p.m., the ship collided with an iceberg and was lost beneath the waves of the Atlantic Ocean. It took the liner only two hours and 40 minutes to sink. And of more than 2,200 passengers and crew members on board, only 706 survived. The wreck would remain lost for another 73 years, hiding its many secrets within the frigid Atlantic waters. And if it wasn't for a man whose whole life had been devoted to exploring the sea, the giant ship might have remained lost for a lot longer. That man was Robert Ballard. As a child, Ballard was obsessed with the ocean. This fascination started when he was just 12 years old. That's when he watched a film adaptation of Jules Verne's science fiction novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. It had everything to spark a young person's imagination, from adventure and strange creatures to a powerful underwater vehicle called the Nautilus. It could travel anywhere in the world you want it to go. From that moment, life on dry land was no longer in Ballard's future. When he was 23, he was assigned to the Deep Submergence Group. There, he helped develop techniques to search the ocean floor. His biggest accomplishment was the creation of Alvin. It was a small, easy-to-maneuver submarine that could carry three people. It also featured an external mechanical arm designed to gather underwater samples while the crew remained safe and dry inside. <laughs> 
Alvin the submarine quickly proved useful for a variety of tasks. For example, once it was used to track down an aircraft that had crashed into the sea. But the vessel experienced a series of setbacks. In one case, it was attacked by a swordfish, which caused the submarine to resurface quickly. The swordfish, still stuck in the outer skin of the submarine, became that night's dinner. And in October 1968, the submarine was being lowered into the water when the cables holding it snapped, sending it careening into the ocean along with three crew members on board. And because the small vessel was still open, it immediately filled with water and quickly began to sink. Luckily, the crew managed to escape, but Alvin was gone. Bad weather hampered multiple attempts to recover the vessel. It wasn't until the following year that it was finally returned to the surface. In time, Alvin would be improved. Its hull would be strengthened by titanium, giving it a higher depth rating, thus making it even better suited for ocean exploration. The specialized submarine would come in handy in many of Ballard's 100-plus expeditions. The man was one of the first to explore an underwater mountain chain called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge in the Atlantic Ocean. And when he found thermal vents in the Galapagos Rift in the late 70s, he also helped discover and document the process of chemosynthesis. That's a complicated chemical synthesis of food energy by bacteria. But his biggest discovery was still to come. Ballard claimed he'd never been a Titanic fanatic, but he eventually became obsessed with finding the ship after watching other explorers try and fail. As he said, Titanic was clearly the big Mount Everest at the time. Many others had tried, many that I thought would have succeeded or should have succeeded but didn't. Ballard began thinking about finding the ship as early as 1973. And four years later, he actually made an attempt. He used the deep sea salvage vessel Sea Probe, which was a drill ship equipped with cameras and sonar. But he was forced to give up when the drilling pipe broke. It just wasn't his time. In the early 80s, a Texas oil man named Jack Grimm tried to find the wreck on three different occasions. Once, Grimm was actually right over the Titanic, but his equipment failed to detect it. That's what we call extreme bad luck. Ballard was just biding his time. He needed a plan and some help. The first issue was getting down to the bottom of the Atlantic. The furthest down he had ever traveled before was 20,000 feet. And this trip took him three hours. And that didn't include the way back up. Ballard knew he could use Alvin, already enhanced with a titanium hull to withstand the pressure of the ocean. But he also needed something that didn't require him to actually go down with it. An unpiloted remote-controlled submarine would be ideal. But first, he would have to create one. He reached out to the authorities, hoping they would provide funding for his project. And though officials had no interest in the Titanic, they were willing to help. Ah, but there was a catch. Ballard had to first focus on tracking down two submarines, the Thresher and the Scorpion, which had sunk to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean in the 1960s. The authorities were hoping to study them to find out why they had sunk in the first place. They also wanted to know if they could be recovered or if it was safe to leave them on the ocean floor. Only when he had successfully completed this task would he be free to use any remaining time on his contract to find the Titanic. With no other options for funding, Ballard took the offer. He got to work. First, he created two new devices. Argo was an unpiloted deep-toed undersea video camera sled. It was designed to take photos and record videos from a series of cameras mounted on it. It could work at depths of up to 20,000 feet, and it could also explore nearly 98% of the ocean floor. Argo was supposed to be tethered to a boat. As the boat moved, Argo would be pulled behind, floating just above the ocean floor. The camera would then transmit images to the surface. The second device was a small robotic vehicle called Jason Jr. 
It was also controlled remotely, which allowed the crew inside a submarine, like Alvin, to get closer to and photograph underwater objects. Ballard was now ready. He knew he had to find those submarines quickly. And it didn't take him long. Much to his relief, the search was relatively simple, and he was able to fulfill his obligations with 12 days to spare. With almost two weeks to devote to finding the Titanic, he set out to explore the ocean. He focused the search close to Newfoundland, Canada, pulling Argo along the ocean floor and reviewing the images it collected. And after a few days of nothing, they eventually found riveted hull plates and a boiler. Could this be it? The next day, a ship's large bow was revealed. On September 1st, 1985, Ballard and his fellow crew members realized they had finally found the infamous ship. The discovery resulted in a mix of emotions. Ballard was excited to be the first to find the Titanic's final resting place. But he was also overwhelmed by the sense of grief for those who had suffered when the ship had gone down. Over the next four days, the crew explored the wreck. They found the crow's nest from where the iceberg had first been spotted. Plus, there was finally evidence of how the massive ship had split in two before sinking, with both halves of the ship found. There was furniture and dinnerware, and sadly, several leather shoes of those who hadn't made it to safety were scattered about the ocean floor. Ballard succeeded where others had failed, and became an instant celebrity around the world. You'd think that locating the Titanic would be enough for one man, but not for Ballard. In 2019, he took on the challenge of solving another mystery, the disappearance of Amelia Earhart. Earhart had attempted to be the first woman to fly around the world. Unfortunately, she disappeared somewhere over the Pacific Ocean in 1937. She and her plane were never found. Ballard hoped that his luck with the Titanic would help with finding where Earhart had gone down, but his expedition failed to find anything. And though Robert Ballard has found more shipwrecks than anybody else, it's only the tip of the iceberg. It's estimated that there are over 3 million shipwrecks in the ocean, and Ballard has only located 100 of them. Now in his late 70s, the man is hoping to encourage young people to continue his work of exploring the ocean and its many mysteries. In 1989, he started the Jason Learning Project to inspire grade school students to pursue science, technology, engineering, and math. He has his own research vessel called the EV Nautilus, after the name of the submarine in Jules Verne's novel, a fitting tribute to the story that inspired his career. On April 10, 1912, crowds gathered at Southampton Beach to wave off what was, at the time, the world's largest and most prestigious ship, the RMS Titanic. The cost of the most expensive first-class parlor ticket was 4350 bucks. That's around $70,000 in today's money. But barely five days after steaming away, the ship was swallowed by the Atlantic Ocean. So let's rewind and go back to what actually happened on that fateful night. The captain wanted to set a speed record for the ship's maiden voyage and arrive early. The ship was deemed unsinkable, so he went full throttle into the dark Arctic waters. After spotting the 100-foot iceberg, the crew desperately tried to steer the vessel away and avoid the collision. But the Titanic was traveling too fast, and the iceberg tore down the side of the ship, creating a huge opening in the hull. It wasn't a continuous rip, and damage was caused in several places. In total, the damage spanned along an area of around 300 feet. But the ship's designers had prepared for the prospect of a collision and added watertight compartments down each side of the ship to act as a buffer zone. Four of these compartments could be breached, and the ship would still stay afloat. But because the iceberg tore down the side of the Titanic, it ripped holes in six compartments. The compartments didn't extend up the total height of all decks and weren't actually sealed at the top. This is why, when more than four were flooded, water reached over the top of the bulkheads and filled the remaining compartments, causing the ship to sink into the ocean. Think of it as water spilling over an ice cube tray. But what if the collision was head-on? 
would it still have sunk? Ships are designed with potential crashes in mind, and most vessels have collision bulkheads in the bow. Most of all, it's like your car's bumper or crumple zone. It's a safety feature that can withstand a direct hit. The bow could have taken some of the impact, and some experts have suggested that if it hit head-on, only two to four of the watertight compartments would have been flooded. So, in theory, the Titanic might not have sunk, and it might have even been able to continue sailing to its final destination at a much slower speed. The force of impact would likely have been huge, though. But although passengers would have been injured by the force, they'd have been able to stay on the ship to wait to be rescued by other ships, rather than being forced into the icy waters of the Atlantic. Still, one of the Titanic's designers, Edward Wilding, suggested that the force of the impact might not have actually been that big. He told the British Inquiry that lots of people scarcely felt the collision, and he believed the ship would not have sunk if it did hit the iceberg head-on. The ship was also designed with remotely operated watertight doors between all compartments, so any floods could have been quickly sorted out. Because Titanic had six breaches from the side collision, and because it happened so quickly, sealing the doors wouldn't have made a difference, as it was essentially impossible to save it by that point. The ship immediately began to flood, with water pouring in at a rate of roughly 7 tons per second, 15 times faster than it could be pumped out. So, while it sounds like the Titanic would have survived had the ship hit the iceberg head-on, this idea does come with some issues. First off, the collision bulkheads were designed to survive a crash with another ship, not a giant iceberg. If two ships collided, both would absorb some of the impact in their bulkheads, sharing the impact and likely staying afloat. But an iceberg is stationary, meaning that Titanic would absorb most of the energy from the collision. If Titanic hit head first, because of the speed it was traveling, the impact would have likely traveled down the whole body of the ship. Just imagine a 46,000-ton ship traveling at around 20 knots. At some point, it hits an iceberg that weighs what could be over 100,000 tons. This collision would likely create a powerful force causing massive damage to the vessel. It is likely that seams would split, staircases would come tumbling down, and rivets would burst open across the ship. All that would have potentially flooded even more compartments. This could have caused Titanic to sink in a matter of minutes rather than hours. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. As we all know, the biggest part of it is hidden underwater. So if Titanic had been traveling head-on, it's likely it would have hit the part of the iceberg below the water first which would send it veering off course. Hitting an iceberg is not like hitting a brick wall. In this case, the ice under the water would have torn open the bottom of the ship and caused damage to the sides. Icebergs also aren't flat, solid objects. If a flat collision happened, the ship might have stayed afloat, but icebergs come in many shapes and sizes, from domes to wedges. Studies have also been done on the steel used to produce Titanic. And the tests show the metal was about 10 times more brittle than the steel we use today. The ship was built before we understood the effects of low temperature on steel. The old steel used to make the vessel would not bend when faced with freezing temperatures, but break. Recovered pieces of Titanic's hull plates show that the hull just shattered on impact. Hitting head-on would also cause a very severe and abrupt stop. So even if the ship hadn't sunk, there would still have been major issues. Think about when you suddenly hit the brakes on your car, or when the bus stops while you're walking down the aisle and you get flung forward. Passengers would have been thrown across the ship, and because the crash happened at night, most people were sleeping, so wouldn't be able to effectively prepare for any sort of impact. This would result in injuries for most people on board. It would be especially bad for those at the front of the ship, where the accommodation for the off-duty firefighters, greasers, and engineers was. But while passengers and off-duty crew may have been thrown out of bed, there would be a lot more survivors than in the original scenario. Many ships have had head-on collisions and made it back to shore. Not many people know that Titanic actually had two sister ships. The White Star Line, the company that built Titanic, also built vessels called Britannic and Olympic. Captain by Edward J. Smith, who would later helm Titanic, the Olympic set off on its maiden voyage in June 1911. 
But much like Ford's sister ship, disaster was just around the corner. On its fifth commercial voyage, Olympic collided with a Royal Navy ship, HMS Hawk. While the Olympic received damage to its side, Hawk crashed into the other vessel head-on. The bow of the Hawk was completely crushed by the collision, but because the ship had watertight compartments, it managed to survive the impact and later returned to shore for repair. Another study case is the SS Andrea Doria, which was an Italian ocean liner that made global headlines in 1956. Like the Titanic, the Andrea Doria was heading for New York City on its 101st voyage when disaster struck. On July 25th, the vessel collided with the 524-foot Swedish passenger liner Stockholm. The Stockholm hit the ship head-on, but the point of impact for the Andrea Doria was on its side. The front of the Stockholm was completely smashed, but because the impact was on its hull, it managed to survive. The Andrea Doria, however, sadly sank due to the collision being on the side of the ship. So these cases could suggest that maybe the Titanic would have survived had it hit the iceberg head-on. But we have to remember that the Titanic hit the thing full speed, whereas both the Olympic and the Andrea Doria were traveling slower.